Good afternoon. One more time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. There we go. All right. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. My parents' journey to the United States. Us as Americans, what we think of when we think of the United States, we think of more concrete symbols like, as you can see here, a bald eagle, the Constitution, the American flag, Statue of Liberty, and even things like the Washington Monument. But when people that outside of the United States think of the United States, they think of more abstract symbols like basic rights and freedoms, like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that us as Americans feel people should be entitled to, but they just don't have. Uh, one of these countries that did not have these rights for a substantial amount of time was Iraq. Oh my goodness. Um, this is the flag of Iraq, and it, it actually reads Allahu Akbar on there. Um, Iraq has had a very long and rich, but sometimes tumultuous history. There was no time more turbulent and basically worse than when the Ba'ath Party took over in 1963. The Ba'ath Party is a group that includes names such as Bashar al-Assad, who is the Syrian dictator currently, and Saddam Hussein, and they believe that the entire Arab world should be united underneath one dictator. Um, in Iraq, the, the Ba'ath Party takeover actually started with the assassination of Abdul Karim Qasim, his name was, and he was a, a communist that ruled the government. And there was a five-year leeway period between the time that he was assassinated and a, a man by the name of Ahmed Hassan al-Bakr became dictator. And during this time, actually, my parents in 1968 and 1967, my parents were born. Um, okay, somebody's got to fix this. <laughs> this is going the wrong way. All right, let's see if the laser works. I guess not. Just look and say slide. All right. Um, so can we go back one? Go back one. There we go. All right, here. In 1967, my mom was born in Najaf, Iraq, to a banker. And in 1968, in January, my dad was born to a physics professor in Baghdad, Iraq, and a high school teacher. Next slide. They lived relatively happy lives underneath Ahmed Hassan al-Bakr for, for 10 years up until Saddam Hussein's takeover of the government. One more. Uh, this is actually the logo of the Ba'ath Party and the Ba'ath Party really started implementing their, their ideals when Saddam Hussein took power. It was my father described it to me as Hitler-esque when he took over and that just really like personifies how bad of a situation it was. Um, when he took over, one of the first things he started doing was he started deporting people and essentially they would be, they'd be taken, they would go to sleep one night and they'd be taken and they'd never be heard from again. And this only got worse as Saddam Hussein's rule went on. Two years later, Saddam Hussein started the Iran-Iraq War. The Iran-Iraq War was probably killed more Iraqis than any other war in the history of Iraq's history. And it started in 1980 over a land dispute between Iran and Iraq. Iran actually had a part of land that the Iraqis had claimed for, and Saddam Hussein invaded Iran and started this war. Uh, during this war, there was more and more discrimination against the religious people, specifically one sect called the Shia, whom both of my parents were a part of. Another thing that he did was he started prosecuting people for speaking about the Ba'ath Party or Saddam in a negative light in any way. Um, the, how he actually implemented this and made this possible was he hired thousands of Iraqis to spy on the citizens of Iraq and any time they 
heard or saw anybody talking against the Ba'ath Party, the Ba'ath Party or Saddam Hussein, they would report to a higher command and essentially they would be deported like I said before. One other thing that he did was he essentially had a draft. It, the army was called jesh -e shabi which basically means popular army. And every male that was over the age of 18 had to join it. Uh, this army was used on the front lines of a war like Iran Iraq war, but Saddam actually had another army that was used to, for his personal protection. One other thing that he did was he, he started controlling the media and the Iraqi people actually could not trust the media anymore at this point in time. So they started listening to news from Britain and the United States like Voice of America and BBC in Arabic, obviously. And, and no, 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 back. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so in 1982, things got even more frightening and there was just more and more religious discrimination and all freedoms were basically taken away. One thing that I read that really struck me was he, the, the writer wrote, he would kill you and kill your family and it wouldn't even matter to him as long as the Ba'ath party was safe. Hundreds of thousands were being killed at this point in time in the Iraq, Iran Iraq war. And one of those people was actually my mom's uncle. And he was, he was killed in the Iran Iraq war. They know that, but they don't actually know how he was killed. And sometime near 15 years later, they actually found his body and finalized that he was actually dead. Um, another thing that he did that was really, really terrible was he actually Anytime Saddam would kill an Iraqi person that he felt was speaking up against the Ba'ath Party or Saddam, he would, every time he killed them, he would take their, an agent would take their body to the family and force them to pay for whether it be the bullets or the grenades or whatever it was. So it was just a really, really terrible situation. And things that it just, everything started deteriorating from the economy to the level of living to the currency, all of that was, it was just going downhill. This long war lasted an entire eight years and Saddam was actually forced to sign a treaty between Iran and Iraq at a point because Iran had actually invaded, had penetrated Iraqi borders at one time and Saddam was worried for his own safety at that point. And during this war, actually, if you can imagine, the most fragile time of a person's life is his or her teenage years during high school. This was when my parents were in high school during when all of this was happening. Um, these are actually two pictures of my dad and mom, my dad being on the left and my mom on the right. My dad went to a, a high school called Baghdad College High School and it was, one of, it was one of the largest, best, and oldest high schools in the Middle East. Um, this high school, just to personify it, the, the size of it, three times Randolph, Garth, and Drake campuses combined. It was just absolutely massive. And there was close to 50 courts and various fields and things of that nature. And it was just absolutely gigantic. Um, so one story that my father actually told me was Saddam's sons named Qusay and Uday actually went to the school at the time that my father was going to the school and they were seen as rude and lazy and just overall dim and this just really shows you how, what kind of family they came from, and what kind of person Saddam Hussein was by his sons. My mom, she went to a school called Al Amiriya which was an all-girls school also in Baghdad. And one thing that she was forced to take along with actually my father is a class called al Wataniya. And when they take it, it's essentially supposed to instill love of the Ba'ath Party and Saddam Hussein in a person. Just to tell you, imagine if us as Americans had to take a class on communism and constantly be taught about it and told how great it is and we wouldn't be allowed to say anything against it. Another thing that they both were straight A students in high school, but this actually didn't really matter in the Iraq high school system because the only thing that truly mattered was this test called the baccalaureate, which was taken once in a high school person's career. And 
when a person took it, it was either science based or humanities based, and when they took it, it was out of 100 points. And the, pre the people with the highest scores got to choose which college they want to go to. My, both of my parents actually got to go to their college of their choice, which was Baghdad University Medical School. Um, another thing that that system really helped was Saddam's people and his constituents because their sons and daughters would, they would be, their scores would be basically bumped up. And now, in the middle of my parents' medical school, the first Gulf War actually began. Uh, this is actually another depiction of my father's high school, actually, and this is the administrative building. One more. All right. Now, this is the Iran, I mean, the first Gulf War. This started when Saddam Hussein annexed Kuwait. The reason he did this was because he felt he had a claim in Kuwait because Britain had actually separated Iraq and Kuwait in the 20s. So he decided that he could annex it. Uh, more and more people were being killed, one of those actually being another one of my mom's uncles who was actually executed by Saddam Hussein. Um, things that happened, this was when the situation really, really began getting worse. Things that happened, the economy, the currency, and the level of living, again, just went down. And then another thing was the electricity was completely taken off, food was rationed, water had to be boiled for fear of infection, and just the infrastructure as a whole was destroyed. And there was also bombings in Baghdad basically daily. So, I mean, at this point, my parents basically realized they had to get out. Oh, this is actually my parents in medical school. On the left, the second from the left is actually my, my mom. And on the, the middle in the blue in the back is my dad. And there, third from the left on the bottom row is my mom. Um, this Baghdad University Med School was considered the best med school in the Middle East and people from all over the Middle East came to it. It was located on the Tigris River and Basically, what instead of instead of bachelor's degree like people who go to med school here have to do, they would do three years of science, basic sciences, and then three years of clinical practice. Um, now, one, more. one year after they graduated from Baghdad University Medical School, Medical School, they actually got married, and they moved to a country called Yemen in 1993. The reason they moved here was because you didn't have to have a visa if you moved from Iraq to Yemen, so it was easier to get there. Um, Yemen, Yemen was a very poor country, as you can see here, and the healthcare system was really bad. In fact, my mom actually had a premature baby that probably would have survived had it been in a more developed country like the United States, but it actually had it died in Yemen because the healthcare system was so bad. My, both of my parents actually worked at the Red Cross. It's called the Red Crescent, actually, in, in Yemen, but they both worked at the Red Cross and volunteered their time. Finally, after two and a half years of living in Yemen, they moved to a country by the name of New Zealand. They moved here in 1995 because they finally had gotten their visa to move to a more democratic country. When they moved here, they basically worked on their qualifications for medical practice throughout their time living here. But one thing that happened was <laughs> I was born in May of 1997 and my little sister was born in November of 1998. And they lived there for four years and then after living there for four years in 1999 they finally moved to the United States of America and they finally reached those rights and things that they had wanted throughout their lives that they've been working so hard for. We, we first moved to Queens, New York, and we've been happy, basically, ever since. And I'd just like to call my mom and dad up here, because I know they're here today. So. And I'd just like to thank them for all the work they've done to get me to this point in my life.
My dad's actually, he's right now an infectious disease specialist in Huntsville Hospital and the infection control chair in Crestwood and Huntsville Hospital. And my mom is an associate professor at UAB Huntsville. Uh, one thing that I'd like to leave you with, if you get anything out of this presentation, is it's encompassed in this quote by a Chinese philosopher by the name of Lao Tzu. He says, a journey of a thousand miles must begin with a single step. And all I'd like to say is, don't be afraid to take that step, even if you're worried and it's unknown and you have no idea what's going to happen to you, don't be afraid to take it, because it'll only lead you to bigger and better things. Thank you.